Welcome back to Starship Simulator, this time for something a little bit different. I won't be covering any features or gameplay, but instead, strap yourself in for some educational content, because today we're going to cover nautical terms and traditions to add some flavor to your Starship experience. The game's developer is interested in incorporating a bit of nautical flavor to help ground the game in the real world making the ship feel like it really is a future extension of seagoing vessels. If you're interested in sounding more like an old salt and less like a landlubber, stay tuned. We'll go through not only a selection of terms and their historical origins in Part 1, but also some common naval traditions in Part 2. Don't feel like you need to sit through it all in one session, though. Take advantage of modern YouTube technology to pause and come back later. Just to be clear, this is purely for adding flavor to your game and is completely optional. I've never actually been that precious about jargon in any field, but the language of sailors is a particular and curious one, and one that continues a legacy hundreds, and in some cases thousands, of years old. A guide like this might be helpful for people who would enjoy sounding salty and professional. If you're in a multiplayer server with hard chargers, for example, or maybe if you're writing procedures or briefings, or writing entire scenarios for a game master session. Or maybe you've simply heard some of these words in passing and are curious what they mean and where they come from. Some nautical words are broadly used, while others are oddly specific. So we'll take a look at where the language of sailors comes from. Here's qualifier number two. My own experiences and many reference materials will be from the point of view of the U.S. Navy, which could be different in some cases from the Merchant Navy or other countries' militaries. Era is also important. In the early 2000s, we used, or didn't use, many terms that were different from earlier times. Feel free to jump into the comments on this one with any terms that I might overlook things that were common in older eras that have phased out, or maybe things in the modern era that have changed since my own experiences 20 years ago. I'm especially interested in cross-cultural exchange. Let me know if your country has different terms or traditions for any of the things discussed here. I'd love to learn more. And the final note, not every nautical term will apply to spaceships, as some terms simply would not make sense to adopt. Remember that, in the end, this isn't a naval ship simulation, it is a spaceship sim. Like aviation, which originally was also based on nautical terminology, spaceship jargon will have evolved over 200 years to fit in with the realities of day-to-day -day life in space rather than on the sea. For example, there will be an engineering station on the bridge, but would it be correct to consider that watchstander a Lee Helmsman? Seems debatable. What about these means of vertical conveyance? A ladder or stairs? And how about this philosophical debate? Is this a pilot or a helmsman? Made even more convoluted considering both are actually nautical terms. So which one is more correct? Is there a difference? Which of these terms would still apply to a spacefaring culture of the future? Let's dive in and maybe we'll be able to answer some of these questions or at the very least, learn enough to make our own educated judgment calls. Let's start this off easy with basic ship terminology. Most of these terms would still apply universally to any vessel sailing the sea or the stars. When describing a ship, the front is the bow, the back is the stern. The left side is called port and the right side is starboard. Popular terms for the top and bottom of spaceships seem to be dorsal and ventral. These are not proper nautical terms, but have made their way into science fiction to become fairly standard. Ventral and dorsal are originally medical and scientific terms relating to bodies of animals, including humans, and are based on the Latin words for back and belly. I have a theory that these terms may have come to science fiction by way of aviation. For a long time, they have been fairly common ways to describe the top and bottom of an aircraft fuselage, and either they carried over into real space programs, or were adopted solely by science fiction writers. Gene Roddenberry, famously, was a bomber and airline pilot, and may have started the trend 
by incorporating the terms into the Star Trek universe, which of course was hugely influential on all sci-fi that followed. Or, possibly, even earlier science fiction writers introduced the terms in the late 19th or early 20th century. Perhaps Jules Verne referred to the top and bottom of his Nautilus this way, or maybe H.G. Wells used them in The War of the Worlds to describe parts of the alien walkers. I don't really know, it's been a long time since I've read those books, and it's been nearly impossible to research. On real ships, we usually would say underside or topside. In dry dock, for example, when we got to walk around underneath the USS Enterprise, we would describe doing work to the underside of the hull, or touching the underside. Topside generally refers to the upper parts of a ship that have access to outside, in other words, the weather decks. The term topsiders describes crew members who get to see the sun, often used derisively by the sad, pasty engineering folk who are stuck in the bowels of the ship. Topsiders is the equivalent to coners in a submarine. In other words, non-engineering crew who work in the front half, or cone, of a sub. Speaking of subs, it is possible that ventral and dorsal might be used by submariners to describe the top and bottom of their boats, but I've never heard that in conversation personally or read it anywhere, so I'm inclined to say no, but with the caveat that I could be wrong. Having said that, ventral and dorsal do seem to be popular terms adopted for spacecraft in most franchises or writings, so I guess could be acceptable to use. The more traditional terms of a ship, though, come to us from the Middle Ages. As you will see, will be a recurring theme in this video. The words are mostly descended from Old English, themselves often variations on words handed down from Europe's favorite maritime tourists, the Vikings. Stern, for example, comes from the Old Norse stira, to steer, indicating the connection with steering sailing ships from the rear. Bow is from Old English, the word boga coming from a Germanic root and meaning to bend, bow, or arch. It describes the way that the planks of a ship had to be bent to make the curved front, the shape most efficient for cutting through water. Prow comes from Old French, again meaning the front of a ship. Prow and bow are technically slightly different, but are often used interchangeably. The left and right sides of a ship are port and starboard, words that also come to us from the Middle Ages, with the Old English words steer and board being combined to mean the steering side of the boat. Before helms with central rudders, ships were often controlled with a steering oar over the right side, supposedly due to the majority of helmsmen being right-handed. This steering oar would interfere with tying up at a dock, so ships would instead tie up on the left side, which became known as larboard, or the loading side. Larboard and starboard were later considered to be confusingly close. Since it was the side that faced the pier, larboard was officially changed to port in the Royal Navy in 1844, followed by the U.S. Navy in 1846. Civilian sailors continued the use of larboard through much of the 19th century, with whalers holding on to the term at least until 1913, maybe beyond. Interestingly, the port side in many non-English languages is based on the Old Norse term backboard. This apparently came from the helmsman standing with his back to the left side of the ship, and is the root of similar words in German, Dutch, Swedish, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Port and starboard are specially denoted by navigation lights. Port is red, and starboard is green, with a white light on the stern. These can be remembered with the adages left for red, meaning that the left or port side of the vessel is red, or red on the right returning, meaning that a vessel is coming towards you if the red is on the right and a danger of collision exists. Aircraft follow these same conventions, although with added lights for more visibility. The rules of ship nav lights is a rabbit hole that I won't cover here, but the general idea is, if another ship has its red light to you, you must stop or give way, while a green light means that you have the right of way and can continue. 
If you're interested, I'll add a link to the references section below to a nice series of videos that do cover the International Collision Regulations, or COLREGS for short, in great detail. Finally, when talking about length of a ship, this is the distance from bow to stern, while the ship's widest point is called the beam. This is usually found around midships. Height, traditionally measured from the waterline, would in space simply be the longest point from top to bottom. Traveling about inside a ship can be described in a variety of ways. The main directions are forward, aft, port, and starboard. Along the center axis of the ship is an imaginary line called the center line. On seagoing vessels, this would follow the keel. On a spaceship, even with no particular keel to speak of, this line is still a useful reference. Moving away from the center line, you're said to be moving outboard. Moving in towards the middle of the ship is inboard. If you're moving from one side of the ship to the other, it can also be said that you are moving athwart ships, which is one of my favorite words to say. You're probably already seeing, though, that these terms don't exactly apply to the circular decks of the Magellan in-game. So here would be another example of where terminology would have to adapt. While inboard-outboard could still be used and be useful, giving directions to a location would also have to include clockwise-counterclockwise, or maybe some other description that would make sense here. Finally, movement through the vertical is simply up and down. So, for example, you might say, go up two decks and outboard three compartments. Above and below describes a spatial relationship, such as above or below the waterline, or maybe to go below from a weather deck. Sailors who are working high in the superstructure of a ship are considered aloft, while divers are considered over the side. I'll talk more about that in a later section, as there are special rules that apply to those situations, and could be similar to EVAs for people doing maintenance outside the ship here in space. Let us move inside the ship now and describe what we see. The floor is called a deck. This can be a continuous welded piece, like a flight deck, or smaller deck plates attached to a framework. Above us is the overhead, sometimes called the deck head. This is the space directly underneath the deck above and usually is crammed with wiring, ducting, and other systems running through the ship. If there is some kind of a drop ceiling or panel, which happens to be what we have on the ship here in most places, that can still be referred to as a ceiling. Generally speaking, though, sailors will call whatever is above them the overhead. Some compartments, such as machinery spaces and engine rooms, will have a place under the deck plates that collects wastewater, called a bilge. Bilge diving is when you have to go under the deck to retrieve lost tools, do maintenance, clean, or paint. Bilge diving can be a punishment or an unpleasant task given to new sailors, but can also be used by wily veterans to sneak up on other watchstanders during water fights. Walls are referred to as bulkheads, or, if it's an outer wall, it is the hull. A partition is a thinner, non-structural wall. I can't think of any examples on the Magellan, but on the Enterprise we had several areas that were made up of partitions, like the chief's mess in the galley, or the entire sickbay. Any room in a ship is referred to as a compartment, or a space. Though there is no technical difference, in practice I noticed that compartments tend to be smaller while a space is more open, such as a machinery space. Some special compartments do have the word room in them, such as stateroom, engine room, or ward room, but the compartment itself is never called a room. A vertical opening in a bulkhead is a door, and can be watertight or non-watertight in this case airtight probably being more appropriate. Ships have plenty of regular, non-watertight doors in them, often going into offices or staterooms. Watertight doors are strategically located throughout the structure of the ship. 
Some of them must remain closed at all times, while others are only closed in emergencies. A knee knocker is the lowest part of a round watertight door, or sometimes even just a structural opening with no door. Knee knockers is fun alliteration, but when you're not paying attention, it's actually your shins that bash into them with blinding pain. They're about six to eight inches off the deck, and the really malicious ones have a raised metal step for increased damage. If a door is vertical, then a hatch is any horizontal opening that allows movement through decks. They often remain open for ease of movement, but are usually watertight when closed. One of the duties of crew members going to general quarters is to close watertight doors and hatches to prevent flooding, or in our case, decompression in the event of combat damage. A passageway is any public thoroughfare for the movement of crew between compartments, in other words, a hallway. Passageway is usually shortened to P-way in casual conversation. When walking in P-ways, you always stay to the right side to keep traffic flowing. During general quarters, the entire starboard side of the ship is devoted to moving forward or up, and port is for moving aft and down. This ensures an orderly, counterclockwise flow of traffic during a stressful situation with crew members rushing to their stations. Sometimes high traffic areas of a ship get special nicknames. During World War II, some U.S. ships called their main passageway Broadway because it connected so many areas, making it a bustling thoroughfare at all hours. I imagine that other ships probably have had fun nicknames for areas like this, though on the Enterprise we didn't use any. Our busiest areas were the decks above and below the hangar bay, and we simply called them by their deck numbers. Our second deck contained the galleys, medical, access to berthings, ammunition magazine elevators, the pay office, access doors to the propulsion plants, damage control lockers, and a lot more. As you can imagine, Pretty much all times of day, there was constant foot traffic on that particular deck. Time to tackle the stairs now, which is going to be our first major gray area. Normally, all stairs on a ship are called ladders. They are often found in their own small compartments called ladder wells, which are essentially stairwells that can be sealed off with watertight fittings. However, real naval ladders are steep, narrow metal contraptions that are held in place with pins for easy removal. These are the things that you see sailors sliding down feet first in movies, a great way to break your ankle in real life. The spiral and decorative staircases on board the Magellan are more akin to steps on cruise ships, which are indeed technically called staircases, such as the Grand Staircase of the Titanic. I think that this one comes down to personal preference, as I can see arguments from both sides. Personally, I would call these stairs, as I just can't in good conscience call them ladders. The stairs in the engineering spaces I would call ladders, though. They're more similar to real naval ladders, being utilitarian, smaller, and a little more vertical. Another term, though, that I discovered could be companionway. Now, I've never used this term personally, as it seems to be more of a sailboat term, or maybe is used on cruise ships, but... It is technically defined as a ship's stairway from one deck to another. So, there you go. Companionway might actually be the perfect compromise to use here on the Magellan. There can be actual ladders on ships as well, of course. One example is the vertical rungs found in escape trunks. And there will eventually be some kind of escape trunk on the Magellan that runs from the bridge to the reactor room. So that would indeed be called a ladder. Escape trunk rungs also happen to be an excellent place to dry your clothing after washing your laundry in the engine room. The heat dries them pretty quickly, and they are well hidden from chiefs and officers who for some reason get mad when they find your skivvies draped all over the compartment. The bow is the forwardmost part of the ship, but the compartment inside the bow is called the forecastle. When you see this word written, it is usually spelled forecastle which actually identifies the word's origins. Back to medieval shipbuilding times. Warships 
had castle-like structures on the fore and aft ends of the main deck. These were multi-deck platforms that let archers fire down on enemy ships and provided a defensive position to repel boarders in hand-to-hand -hand combat. By the 16th century, though, cannons had replaced archers, and the aft castle morphed into the raised quarter deck that we still recognize on sailing ships. The fore castle mostly disappeared, but the name stuck, coming to mean the area forward of the mast. Enlisted crews' quarters were often located there in the bow of the ship, becoming an important meeting place for crew discussions or recreation. Sailors are inherently lazy, so the name was eventually shortened in conversation to Foxel, which is now the proper name. Sometimes in writing, depending on the author, you'll see Foxel abbreviated this way, an effort to show the correct pronunciation to landlubbers. In modern ships, the Foxel houses the anchoring chains and equipment, and depending on the size of the ship, can still be used for official ship ceremonies and gathering the crew. Here on the Magellan, the forecastle area will essentially be where the observation deck and park will be, continuing the tradition of crews gathering up forward to socialize and relax. Another important item located at the bow of the medieval ship, either above or in the forecastle, was the ship's toilet, or head. Named because it was at the head of the ship, Waves would help wash away waste, and the wind would carry the smell away from the ship. Only the captain of a sailing vessel would have his own personal head. All other crew members had to share the ship's head at the bow. The term first appears in print in 1708, in a book written by Woods Rogers, a famous Caribbean pirate hunter and governor of the Bahamas. Likely, though, the term was in circulation long before that, as the front of a ship had been known as the head since 1485. Today, all modern bathrooms on board a ship are called heads, regardless of their location. At a minimum, they include a single commode, but a large head for a birthing compartment can include sinks, mirrors, and showers as well. In 1945, German U-boat U-1206 was sunk due to a series of unfortunate events in the ship's head. Just off of Scotland, a sailor attempting to flush the overly complex toilet opened the wrong valves, and seawater flooded in. The flooding damaged the batteries, forcing the sub to surface where she was bombed by British planes. After sinking, three men died in the waves before the crew made it to shore, where they were captured by Scottish civilians. Another important space on board is the ship's galley, or mess decks. This is where the ship's enlisted crew eats in a cafeteria-style setting. Navy food is generally called chow, the queue waiting for food known as the chow line. The word chow seems to have come from the Americanization of the Chinese word chow, meaning to fry or cook. Immigrants brought this word to California as early as the 1700s, and in blending their native language with English, began to refer to any type of food as chow chow. In the 1800s, huge amounts of Chinese workers poured into America to build the Transcontinental Railroad, while at the same time, American clipper ships were making increased voyages to and from China. Sailors apparently picked up this slang, and somehow, eventually, it became official Navy usage. Alternatively, in the British Navy, along with many Commonwealth countries, Navy food is called scran. Supplementing sailors' diets with sultanas, currants, raisins, and nuts, bags marked scran were always being loaded aboard Royal Navy ships, the word eventually coming to mean any food. My ship had two galleys, one forward, one aft. Chow lines stretched back on both port and starboard sides from the serving areas. With the air wing on board, we had a crew of 6,000 and standing in a chow line could take 45 minutes to an hour. This severely limited your time off, as the option was usually either sleep or eat, but not both, before you had to go back to your next watch. Obviously, smaller ships or subs don't have this kind of traffic, and getting chow is much easier. Some galleys might even have 24-hour operations, depending on the ship. 
For us, we had four standard meals per day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mid-rats. Mid-rats is short for midnight rations, the lunch equivalent for those crew members who have night watches. Officers take their meals in wardrooms, which are much more fancy, and chief petty officers get their own chief's mess, which is not quite as fancy, but still separate from the rabble. On the Magellan, the VIP observation room could be considered equivalent to a wardroom, hosting officers, visiting dignitaries, but off limits to the enlisted crew as rank does have its privileges. At this point, we can also cover a couple of other interesting food adjacent terms. Gidunk is a term that means junk food, and as far as I know, was only ever used in the US. It can refer to candy, ice cream, soda, or any snacks from a vending machine, but can also mean the location on a ship where these items are sold. This is an older term that had already fallen out of use by the early 2000s, as none of my generation used it. The word gidunk makes its first appearance in the 1920s in a comic strip called Harold Teen. Harold Teen ran from 1919 to 1959, created by Carl Ede, as a Sunday comic for the Chicago Tribune. The comic's characters spent much of their time at an ice cream parlor, where the special was the Gee Dunk Sunday. It makes sense that Gee Dunk would make its way into the military, a job mostly comprised of young people who grew up with the comic. Big ships like battleships and carriers would have shops called Gee Dunks that were separate from the galley or the ship's store and were essentially ice cream parlors. As American culture phased out soda jerk and ice cream parlor culture through the 1950s and 60s, gee dunks disappeared off of ships as well, though the name stuck to describe any junk food in the ship's store or the store itself. It's often commonly said that gee dunk comes from the sound of vending machines dispensing snacks or cans, making a gee dunk sound. But to me, this has always seemed coincidental at best, and I think it was made up much later by sailors who had long forgotten the Herald Teen references. While my friends and I refused to use the word gidunk with a straight face, another word that is arguably just as silly was used without a second thought. Scattered around the ship are water fountains for the crew's use. Depending on your upbringing or location, you might call these drinking fountains, or bubblers instead. But on board ship, this is a scuttlebutt. Another term handed down by the medieval English, a butt, is a cask of liquid, somewhere in the neighborhood of 126 imperial gallons, or 570 liters. Fresh water would be stored in these butts on sailing ships, and scuttling meant making a hole in it so that the water could be withdrawn. A scuttled butt was essentially the office water cooler, as crew would congregate there to exchange gossip while they grabbed a drink. This is why scuttlebutt is also a word for rumors or gossip. By the late 1800s, wooden barrels had been replaced with metal drums, and the first mechanically cooled scuttlebutts were on the USS Olympia in 1895. So, now we know what to call things inside and outside a ship, and learned some specific compartments, how do we navigate around the ship to find these places? On a ship, each compartment has what is called a reflective bullseye, showing the address within the ship and who owns the space. On this bullseye is a tack number, because in Navy speak, a hyphen is pronounced tack. The word tack comes to us from the use of signal flags, dating back to the 18th century. The Royal Navy began using simple signal flags as early as 1338, though some flags, like the red flag of battle, may have started with the Phoenicians as early as 1100 BCE. Modern complex signaling comes from systems evolving in the late 1700s and early 1800s and includes the French contribution of creating signal codes for numbers. Signal flags were run up on ropes called halyards to convey messages to other ships. A tack line 
is a six-foot space in between groupings of flags, making it clear a new word or message is starting. When spoken, this space was called tack and was written as a hyphen. At some point, the term spread from signaling to general naval use. Sometimes bulkheads themselves will have a frame number or a full tack number on them. This navigation device tells you exactly where you are on a ship and eventually becomes more useful than using a map once you're used to it. The number tells you at a glance what deck you're on, whether you are port or starboard of center line, how far aft or forward you are in a ship, what job that space is intended for, and what division owns the space and is responsible for it. On board the Magellan, we see a similar system in place. On each panel, there is a tack number that shows us the deck number, the quadrant, meaning forward, aft, port, or starboard, the ring number, as larger decks do have multiple rings, the panel number itself, and which side of the passageway it's on. Remember, due to the circular layout of the ship, port or starboard would not be useful indicators, so left and right is used instead. Left or right is determined as you move clockwise around a ring or with your back to the core on straight sections. Let's look now at some notable members of the crew. This will again be from my American point of view. Other countries' navies may have different rank titles and civilian ships are organized differently, but the responsibilities of the roles will be fairly universal. This is our commanding officer, the CO, or skipper. This is the captain of the ship. Captain, in this case, is a title, not necessarily a rank. What I mean by that is that sometimes on smaller ships or submarines, the commanding officer can actually be a commander or even a lieutenant commander, almost any rank really, depending on the size of the craft. Regardless of rank, though, the officer in overall command is called the captain. CEOs have many responsibilities underway, but can be summed up by saying that they are the ultimate authority on board, are responsible for the mission and safety of the ship and its crew, and also bear the responsibility of the actions of the crew under their command. They have authority over passengers or prisoners, can perform marriages, perform inspections or searches throughout the ship, but are also required to maintain all ship's logs, keep all ammunition and dangerous materials secure, ensure the ship's crew is well trained in normal operations and emergency procedures, and complete ship's maintenance on schedule. The captain plans all ship's movements and sets policy and procedures on board. The captain is also responsible for disciplining the crew. The non-judicial punishment procedure, or NJP, is more commonly referred to as captain's mast. As you can imagine, this term dates from the days of sail when offending crew members were said to be brought before the mast, in other words, up on deck under the mainmast. Ceremonies were held under the mast on regular occasions, usually on Sundays before divine services. Captain's mast can also technically be held to officially recognize crew members for a job well done, but in modern times, the term is primarily linked to disciplinary action. The captain stands alone as jury and judge and has final stay on punishments. Captain's mast is less serious than a court-martial, though punishments often include reduction in rank, forfeiture in pay, extra duties, restriction to the ship, or confinement to the brig. A captain has authority to impose NJP over any military personnel on the ship, including members of other units embarked on the ship or officers. Officers going to captain's mast are limited in punishments to official reprimands and up to one month of restriction, but if they are brought before an admiral's mast, an admiral may impose more serious punishments if their offense warrants it. The executive officer, or XO, or first officer, is the second in command and ensures the captain's orders are carried out. 
The XO is much more involved with managing the ship on a daily basis than the captain. Their duties include coordinating ship's drills, exercises, inspections, managing security, and evaluating ship's officers and crew. They ensure the ship is ready for combat and is being operated in a safe manner. While the CO has the ultimate responsibility, it falls to the XO to carry out these duties. The XO can be seen observing drills or mingling with the crew more frequently than the CO. The XO must review personnel records and maintain discipline. XOs on large ships will work with the legal department and can issue disciplinary actions that do not require a captain's mast. It is the XO, though, who determines what offenders will need to go before the captain or even perhaps a full court-martial. A good XO also recognizes that managing ship's morale is part of their duties, and to this end they might organize fun events, movie nights, or even create comedic video shorts featuring members of the ship's crew. Finally, the XO also needs to be ready to take over command at any moment should the captain be incapacitated. On real ships, an XO's battle station is usually far away from the captain's station to ensure a single hit will not take out both. A great real-world example of the varied duties of an exec is an incident that happened underway on my ship. Over several weeks, the quality of midrats was steadily becoming worse and worse. Remember, midrats is supposed to be the main meal for those of us who had night watches, and for some people, might be the only meal they got in for the day. Complaints got so bad, even our marines on board were saying that they would rather eat field rations, which is certainly saying something. To address this, the XO stayed up one night and, unannounced, joined the enlisted chow line. Not only did he get to mingle with the enlisted crew and directly hear their complaints about the food, but he happened to join us on the absolute worst night. We were served a meal of crunchy, undercooked rice with a red water that was once considered pasta sauce. No additional options were provided, as was supposed to be the case, though God knows what they might have thought up. The next day, the XO lowered the boom on the supply department. It was discovered that troublesome galley staff were being assigned to midrats as punishment to get them out of the way, and left to their own devices with no supervision as their chiefs or officers didn't feel like working nights. A huge shakeup followed, and thereafter a supply chief or officer had to be present for all meals, and food quality finally came back up to an acceptable level. Here is a typical example of the chain of command on a Navy ship. At the head is the CO, followed by the XO. They have their own department, the Executive Department. This includes administrative yeomen, journalists, the Public Relations Office, and onboard television and radio stations. Also part of this department is the MWR Office, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. This is a small team of civilians on board whose job is to organize fun onboard events and to be liaisons with any port the ship pulls into. MWR runs events like weekly karaoke on the mess decks, steel beach picnics on the flight deck, sporting event watch parties in the hangar bay, celebrity visits or USO tours, and organizing bus tours ashore. The Royal Navy has a similar organization called the National Canteen Service, who are also civilians, serving on board British ships, providing services to sailors and their families. Reporting to the captain and exec are the various department heads of a ship. A department is the largest organizational unit on a ship, and would include things like medical department, engineering or reactor departments, operations department, supply department, etc., etc., Department heads issue captain's orders down to their people and report up to the captain on the readiness and status of their departments. Department heads can be up to the rank of captain themselves, though, of course, they never outrank the captain of the ship. More often, they are commanders or lieutenant commanders. Sometimes, department heads have specific traditional nicknames. The RO, or reactor officer. The Chang, Chief Engineer. The First Lieutenant is the Head of Deck Department. 
The weapons department head might sometimes be called WEPS. You get the idea. Departments are broken down next into divisions, and division officers report to the department head. Each department can have many divisions. Engineering departments, for example, usually include things like the damage control division, propulsion or non-propulsion mechanics, and electricians. Reactor departments usually consist of all propulsion-related divisions on nuclear-powered ships, except of course on Enterprise where we had our own fun mix of engineering and reactor departments that didn't make sense to anybody else. Next down the line are the individual work centers within a division. This could be an individual space, like an engine room, a machine shop, or could be a group of people, like internal communications or navigators. A work center is usually run by a chief petty officer, though some work centers also have junior officers in charge. So for example, in my case, I worked in engineering department, MDiv, Work Center EM-14, which was number four engine room. On board the Magellan, a good example might be a science lab. Let's take oceanography. This would be part of the science department, and then maybe something like a planetary scans division. Then the work center would be oceanography itself. All of the scientists working in that lab would always be assigned there and would be specialists in ocean science and the lead scientist or most senior scientist would be responsible for personnel rotations and all of the admin of that lab. Other labs, whatever they may be, say an atmospheric or maybe archaeological lab, would be separate organizational entities, but all would be under the control of the division officer for that planetary scans division. I'm sure this is way beyond the scope of what the game will actually implement, but again, this is to give you a flavor of chains of command and how the ship might be administered in real life. The command master chief is another important person in a ship's command structure. This is the most senior enlisted crew member on board, so that would be whatever rank is appropriate for a particular country's navy. In the US Navy, master chief is the highest enlisted rate you can reach. The CMC acts as the liaison between the captain and the enlisted crew. They advise the CO on matters of morale, discipline, family support, and operational readiness. On submarines, you'll hear the Command Master Chief referred to as Chief of the Boat, or COB. Cleaning a ship is one of the most important jobs aboard. Everyone cleans every day. Dust buildup can be a fire hazard, as can dripping lubricants, oils, or paints. Sickness can spread fast through a ship if surfaces are not regularly disinfected. In Starship Sim, it will be the steward department that will be responsible for the majority of cleaning. In historical context, U.S. Navy stewards were specifically responsible for preparing and serving meals to the ship's officers as well as cleaning and taking care of officers' uniforms, bedding, and staterooms. The steward rating disappeared in 1975 when it was rolled into a new rating, Mess Specialist. This ended the largely segregated nature of Navy stewards, who had mostly been Black or Asian. In a modern international context, stewards today are the ship's housekeepers, mainly aboard leisure vessels like cruise ships. Steward departments prepare and serve food, swab decks, clean surfaces, maintain plants, wash dishes, run the ship's laundry, and more. In the Magellan's case, I could see them also running the common recreation areas, like the movie theater, park, VIP lounge, and bowling alley. On some modern ships, I assume depending on size, the steward department actually takes over the duties of a supply department and are responsible for ordering, receiving, and issuing ship stores. Positions usually include a chief steward, essentially the department head, and a chief cook who specifically deals with food safety and preparation. Up to the bridge now for a look at some command watches. Real bridge watch teams are more complicated than we normally see in science fiction and therefore won't translate directly to the game, but 
I'd like to talk about it briefly for context anyway. There's going to be a lot of terms here coming up, but don't worry too much about the details. Just try to follow along. This is simply to compare and contrast the real world versus what we've come to know from science fiction. Welcome to the bridge of the real USS Enterprise. This diagram is taken from a qualification study guide circa 2006. The photocopies were already rough when we got it, but I've tried to clean up the labels a little here. Let's begin on the far left with the captain's chair. The captain comes and goes as he pleases. He is not attached to any particular watch team. When he's on the bridge sitting in his chair, he has a good view of not only the bow of the ship and where she was going, but also to his left and behind him, the flight deck, so he can observe flight ops. When present, he can issue orders directly to the con officer, but the ship is primarily under the care of the OOD, the officer of the deck. The OOD is responsible for the safe operation of the ship and makes reports to the captain. If you're not familiar with this at all as a concept and you need an example, think of that one episode of Star Trek with Data running the Night Watch on the Enterprise D. He is essentially the officer of the deck in that situation, the most senior officer commanding the ship, although he would then report anything of note to the XO or CO above him. The OOD is assisted by the junior officer of the deck. The JOOD assists with reports and workload. Any routine reports that do not require the OOD's immediate attention usually are given to the JOOD instead. The conning officer is the third officer in control of the ship. Con, as it's called, is usually a junior officer, an ensign, or maybe a lieutenant junior grade, who gives direct orders to the helmsman. Khan may take orders directly from the captain or the OOD, and then orders the appropriate changes to speed and course. Smaller ships may not have a dedicated Khan only in OOD, but if present, the Khan watch station gives junior officers valuable hands-on experience in sailing their ship, all the while under the supervision of a skilled veteran. When any of these bridge officers are said to have the Khan, it means that they are in direct control of the ship. Behind the OOD are the helmsman and the lee helmsman. These are enlisted sailors, usually from deck department. A helmsman controls the rudder, while the lee helmsman controls speed. The lee helmsman orders up bells on an EOT, engine order telegraph, which the engine rooms acknowledge and set their plants accordingly to answer those bells. Some ships may combine both watch stations into one. I remember seeing the helmsman on board a frigate having an airplane-like throttle that either sent requests to the engine room or possibly directly controlled the gas turbine that powered the ship. I had only a brief tour of the bridge while the ship was underway, so I don't know exactly the nature of those controls, but there did seem to be only a single helmsman. This brings us back now to the philosophical questions I posed at the beginning. The Magellan will have an engineering station on the bridge, so could they be considered a Lee Helmsman? Or would that station have more direct control over the propulsion plant than simply ordering up bells? If that's the case, then this could perhaps be more of an engineering officer of the watch station, or EAO, rather than a simple Lee Helmsman. And do we call the crew member flying the ship a Helmsman or a pilot? Pilot is also a nautical term and is a sailor with specific knowledge of a dangerous or congested waterway. Pilots come aboard and temporarily take command of ships on their way to or from berthing, or through canals or locks. This job dates back to ancient Rome and Greece, with the word pilot coming from the Latin derivative of the Greek word for oar. Of course, today a pilot is also someone who flies an airplane, controlling not just a rudder, but movement through all three axes of movement. They also have direct control over power outputs. As with the stairs, I have no correct answers here for you. Both terms seem to apply. I think that, once again, it'll come down to whatever the game decides to call these stations, as well as your personal preference on your own ship or in a multiplayer session. Personally, I would use helmsman for a large ship like this one, and a pilot 
would be for a small craft like a shuttle or a fighter. That basically follows the set sci-fi convention, but it is a distinction that works okay for me. Let's finish up the bridge tour now, just a couple other stations to go, and then head towards the conclusion of this first video. The BMOW is the bosun mate of the watch, a senior enlisted watch stander. The bosun supervises other enlisted watch standers on the bridge, is a qualified helmsman himself, and assists the OOD and JOOD as necessary. He updates the Telltale panel, a grease pencil status board that keeps the crew up to date with crucial systems around the ship. The bosun also makes announcements over the 1MC, the shipboard PA system. 1MC announcements are usually preceded by the bosun's mate of the watch blowing his bosun's whistle or ringing the ship's bell, depending on the announcement. The classic phrase, now hear this, now hear this, alerts the crew to listen up for important information. Sailors are drilled from day one of boot camp to be silent during a 1MC announcement. So as soon as something comes over the speakers, everybody just stops moving and gets silent. And is actually one of the habits that I still have to this day. If I'm in the middle of a conversation out in a store somewhere and I hear the PA system come on, I will instinctively stop talking and listen. So the 1MC is considered extremely important because it's, it's passing along information to the entire ship meaning that it is something that is pertaining to everyone and therefore is important. In the far right seat sits the navigator. An officer, the ship's navigator, is the department head of the navigation department, and they also come and go from the bridge as they please. Quartermasters are the enlisted navigators, and they are part of a watch team, so they will rotate with the rest of the bridge watch teams. Quartermasters man the CO's plot and chart rooms, and the quartermaster of the watch is the senior navigation watch station. Quartermaster of the watch advises the OOD with course and speeds and makes official entries in the ship's log. They also report weather changes and control the ship's nav lighting at night. With that, let's wrap this episode up here. This seems like a good place to stop. This was quite a list of naval terms and onboard jobs but there is much more to cover. With this base of knowledge, though, next time we can get into some more complex subjects. I'm eager to explain watch standing, for example, because I've seen a lot of confusion and misunderstanding surrounding that topic. Some ideas here today have been simplified for basic understanding, and many terms have been skipped either because they don't apply or are outside the scope of the game. In the description below, though, you will find a list of references if you're interested in doing more of a deep dive. Also, they can be found in the references section of my Discord page, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Join me again next time for part two, where we will cover more in-depth topics like qualifications, keeping time underway, brightworks, coxcombing, damage control, and more. Thank you so much for joining me this time, though. I hope you enjoyed it, and I especially hope that you found it educational, as that is my main point here. Until next time, fly safe out there.